Hi everyone, my name is Caroline Sanders and this is my talk, AI is More Than Math. Um, I'm an artist and design researcher. Um, I've been studying how people understand to relate and then create within large systems and platforms for the past seven years. I've worked as a UX designer in advertising, a design researcher for IBM Watson. I've held arts and writing residencies with BuzzFeed, IBM and Google's Pair, People and Artificial Intelligence Group. And I'm currently a fellow with Harvard University and Mozilla exploring explainable AI. And I often look like this a lot when I'm studying people on the internet. And I've been thinking a lot about how do we make AI pretty un understandable for everyone. And I'm really narrowly focused on this one goal. How can we make, as designers, technologists, researchers, and creators, uh, more understandable? How can we make AI more engaged? How do we make it feel more human? And I think it's with really, really good design. And when I say design, I don't just mean product design or UX design. I mean design holistically as a whole. Design as a medium, design as a methodology, and the ways in which design touches uh, every part of our everyday lives. So my title is actually a little bit of a misnomer, because algorithms, AI, and machine learning, they are math and they're code, but they're also data sets and intentional design. Algorithms are designed to do things, from translating text into speech, to creating predictions from data, from recognizing and sorting images together. Algorithms are also really about how information is processed. Kate Devlin, who I believe is a speaker also here at Republica, uh, defines AI in her book as the, concepts of, the concept of machines being able to carry out tasks in an intelligible manner. At present, none of the AI in use today involves machines actually being sentient or conscious, nor do they have general intelligence. Rather, they use data to understand patterns of outcomes and that way learn from previous situations. Really, AI, machine learning, and algorithms are just pattern matching and sorting. But really, really, what is AI? Mimi Onoa and Mother Cyborg describe AI in their book, The People's Guide to Artificial Intelligence, as AI being a bit more like salt. On its own, it's not really a product, and it's not really a feature. It doesn't really do much alone. But it's a transformative ingredient, and it's technology. Salt, for example, on its own is not a meal. I don't know if you should eat salt actually alone by itself in large quantities. And it's not really anything other than a flavor. How interesting really is salt? It's singular. But when combined with other ingredients to make a dish, it completely changes an entire meal. AI is like that. AI is transformative in product design as well as everyday life. But AI is also data. And I think data is as important as the algorithm in the code that is written, because data can determine what an algorithm does. Data is used to train an algorithm in machine learning systems. An algorithm that's designed to analyze social media data is trained on social media data. So data is incredibly important. And data is key. And data inside of machine learning can be things like language, or conversation, or images, or text, or any kind of output, for example, from social media. It can be things like the frequency of interactions. It's a lot of things related to SEO and marketing, but it's all those things are actually human outputs. And let's think about that for a second, because any kind of data out there is created for and by people, even if it feels inherently mechanical or inherently technical. What about data about shipping or any kind of uh, shipping information? When something is sent from one place to another, is that human? Well, who's sending something and who is receiving something? Shipping data, for example, is inherently human. And I think it's important to think about this when it comes to data. There's nothing cold or mechanical about data. It's all people. So we have to treat data then as a sensitive object, as a really kind of precious material. It needs to be handled with care. I want to highlight some interesting projects that focus on data and algorithms. And this is one of my favorites. This is by Mimi Onoa, and it's her project, The Library of Missing Data Sets. Missing data sets are, are blank spots in otherwise data-saturated spaces. 
the Library of Missing Data Sets, started in 2016, is an ongoing physical repository of those things that have been excluded in a society where so much else is collected. Let's think about that for a second. What are times when uh, perhaps not being seen or collected is good? For example, facial recognition software has a really hard time recognizing different races, particularly black faces. This can be good if facial recognition software is sort of deployed ad hoc or holistically across any kind of CCTV camera. And this kind of space, sure, being unrecognized by the system is actually really positive. But when is it bad that a system doesn't recognize you? Well, what happens with facial recognition software deployed at a border crossing? What happens if that system doesn't actually recognize your face and you can't cross the border? What happens if you're not seen? Are you detained? Where do you go and what happens to you in this space? And was the system designed with this kind of error in mind? Imagine how scary that would be, right? This is another art project I really like that sort of builds upon this idea of algorithms being fallible. This is Heather Dewey Hagborg's work, probably Chelsea. What we're looking at are 30 different possible portraits of Chelsea Manning that are algorithmically generated by an analysis of her DNA and then 3D printed. What's interesting is technically the system Heather is using to analyze her DNA is one that's used pretty frequently, especially in bioengineering. Um, but none of these portraits are actual portraits of Chelsea. She doesn't look like any of these faces. But technically, really technically, none of these portraits are wrong. But the way that we see them, none of them are actually correct, are they? And this project really isn't about AI, but I'm striving to, to build here an idea about how products and data can work together and how an algorithm, especially when it learns from human data, from changing data, from data fed into da uh, our daily products, can fail. And that's why we need to deeply investigate data within these systems and how these systems are designed. I want to give you a few examples. So what we're seeing here are two different Google search results. This is one. This is the other. These were done in 2016. Can anyone sort of guess what they are? This is what happens when you Google professional hair, and this is unprofessional hair. As you can see, one is overwhelmingly white, and one is not. And this was uncovered by The Guardian in 2016, I think specifically by Lee Alexander. And it's important in this case that we also think about the intentions of this. Is Google Search a product? Well, it is. How many of you have used Google Search today or yesterday or in the last week or the last month? And think about the amount of times you use that in your daily life. Looking at these examples, one thing I want to highlight is I don't think the Google Search team set out to make a shitty product. I don't think they set out to also make something that is sort of this erroneous. But we can look at this and maybe start to hypothesize the diversity of the data set. What image data sets were they pulling from? How are they training these search queries? We can even hypothesize the diversity of the engineering team. No one really sets out to make a bad product, but it's not a bug, it's a feature until it's fixed. Let me give you another example. This is a, a product called Faceception, made by an Israeli company that is using algorithms to detect emotions and faces. Now, stepping outside of the problem, the most obvious problem with this, other than the surveillance aspect, let's think about how wrong facial detection could be. How many of you have heard of resting bitch face? One of my best friends has what I call resting bitch voice. So when I text her a lot, like, oh, I'm coming into town, she'll be like, oh, I'm so excited to see you. But in person, she's like, I've missed you. It's been so long since we've hung out. But she's really, really excited to see me. But if you were to analyze any of the like, emotion registering in her face, she would look probably really pissed off. Or maybe let's give like, another example, maybe one that's also kind of a little bit more realistic. How many of you have ever smiled or laughed when you've been really scared or uncomfortable to, diffu to diffuse an uncomfortable situation. I bet a lot of women or marginalized groups in this room have felt that, right? Were you actually happy in that moment? Is that moment like the evocative, most truthful moment of you in that time? No, it's not. Can we emote all the things that we're feeling 
uh, in real time? Should we? I don't think so. We should have the ability, right, to mask or hide what we're feeling. And sometimes social situations call for that. I sound probably really funny and gregarious right now. You have no idea if I'm having a good day or a bad day. Nor should you, because I'm on stage, like lecturing at you. But one of the things I want to highlight is. If this is being used to train on the ways that we classically think of emotions, sort of presenting themselves, it's important to think about how wrong that can be, and how this could be used to sort of infer any kind of deeper findings or meanings from an event. And then on the other side of things, it's always important to think about: Do we express happiness culturally the same? Do I, as an American, express happiness the same as a German, or as someone from mainland China, or as someone from India? Does happiness look the same universally? Do we express happiness in that way? So, a lot of this talk is trying to highlight this idea of what is bad, what is good, and how do you sort of more deeply dive into artificial intelligence? Bad AI isn't just because algorithms are broken and tech is awful. It's really, I think, trying to understand the nuances between what's in your data set, how it can unintentionally train your algorithms, how that can change the product. And how that can then harm users, but it's also what you intend to do with the product, as we saw with Faceception, and how the intentions of that design can harm people. And then it's also important to think about what, how are we defining harm? How can we also fix harm? How I think a great way to try to mitigate this idea of harm, sort of holistically, is moving towards making AI more accessible. And we can look at open source as a way for this, like. Should there be code releases that are open to external audits, data sets that the public can dig into and actually see, explanations that are easy to understand on how the algorithm was made, how how old it was, and who made it? This is what I mean by explainable AI. Let's take what artificial intelligence is when it's inserted into a space and actually break down and explain what it's doing, when, and how.、And、I think there are some pretty good examples that start to push towards this, especially with data. And this is where data is important. And I want to highlight this project that I really love, and I love it not because I'm a Mozilla fellow, but this is Common Voice. Common Voice is a project by the Mozilla Foundation and Corporation. It's an open-source data set. Common Voice is one of the largest public-domain transcribed voice data sets ever made. It has more than 1,400 hours of voice data with 18 languages represented. Now, why would we need an open-source voice data set? What does it do? What could it possibly solve? Well, voice-to-text automation is the frontier of creating more accessible products. This is AI helping in disability and accessibility. And Common Voice supports multiple languages, and that means multiple dialects and accents. That's something that Siri doesn't quite do very well. But anyone, any company, could use Common Voice right now. Or as I mentioned in the description of this talk, a project I've been working on, which is an open-source project in the making, which is Feminist Dataset. The Miss Dataset comes out of the culmination of a lot of different work I've been doing over the past couple of years, and I had this idea when I was focusing mainly on toxicity and harassment in social networks and looking at toxicity in language and algorithms. Part of what I do outside of looking at explainable AI is I actually study online harassment in the alt right, which may make the first gift you saw a lot more <laughs> easy to understand. What this means is I look at a lot of traumatic data. I look at how people organize and congregate, especially inside of white supremacy and white nationalist groups, on spaces like Discord, Twitter, 4chan, 8chan, and Reddit. And outside of and within this work, I started to make different kinds of publications to support the work I was looking at. For example,、um, looking at how the alt right, when、uh, when they're kicked off of a platform or a different space, will make an alt right version of that. So when they're kicked off Patreon, they'll go to a, a place that is actually called Hatreon.、Um, I also made a dictionary that was trying to codify and define different slang terms that were being used by the alt right. This hate speech dictionary is currently being used by the Southern Poverty Law Center to sort of support a lot of the hate speech work that they're looking at. But it's important in this in this scenario to like know and highlight that language, especially when it's in a digital space, is data. So even this act of creating this hate speech data set, I was contributing to a, I was contributing to creating data to study larger, larger data sets of hate speech. 
And I got to a point where I wanted to have a bit of a break from what the majority of my work was focusing on. I wanted to make something that could counteract the hate speech I was studying. I wanted to make something that would sort of challenge our concepts of how inequity and bias sort of manifest inside of a data set, hence the creation of Feminist Data Set. Feminist Data Set is a multi-year-long project that's collecting and archiving written feminist works, be it song lyrics, podcasts, transcripts, interviews, essays, and blog posts, which will be put into a public repository that also functions as, as an archive that can then be used to try to imagine what a feminist chat interface could look like and what this data set can sort of really do within natural language processing perimeters. It's my way of intervening in AI, and it's also my way of trying to wonder how can we ethically create with data, how can we protest with data? So Feminist Data Set is trying to offer this new way to think about data sets and data collection by specifically looking at intersectional feminism as a framework and structure for data interrogation and community collection of data. Um, this is an example of Feminist Data Set being installed at the Victoria and Albert Museum. This project is also really trying to push the idea that something as benign as data collection can be utilized and activated as community protest and community collaboration. We live in a data-saturated environment, and if we're ever going to figure out if ethical data and ethical, ethical data collection is possible, I believe this has to come from the community and community-organized events. And this is really what Feminist Data Set is trying to explore. Feminist Data Set is also a deeper part of work that I've been looking at around where, uh, where design fits in creating equity, especially within software design and products. Before I get into the next couple slides, I need to give you some quick design background. How many of you have heard of human-centered design? Okay, okay, some. So I'm glad I included this slide because I added that this morning. Um, human-centered design is a methodology that is used, is used, or a variation of it is used in almost every product that you're touching right now. It's an idea that, and a framework that was created by the design firm IDEO. And it comes from a paper that was published in 1989 on human-centered systems. Human-centered design is defined as a design and management framework that develops solutions to problems by involving the human perspective in all steps of the problem-solving process. So human-centered design is just really this deeper framework that asks, how does this affect people, and tries to break people into different kinds of groups. Now, this probably doesn't actually sound very revolutionary to us right now, but in the 1980s it was. And so, all the different products and tech we're using, a lot of the way that it's designed comes from this space. But I think to create with AI, we need a new kind of framework, one that moves beyond human-centered design and focuses on human rights-centered design, one that focuses on data accountability and creation. So the idea of human rights-centered design is inspired by the United Nations International Declaration on Human Rights Frameworks, which outlines basic inalienable rights afforded to all people. We can think about this maybe more deeply as sovereignty for the individual, but I want to argue that sovereignty and dignity is user agency, especially in relationship to data ownership, when it's enacted in technology and design. Right now, we aren't giving consumers any ways to opt in, opt out, change, or adjust how algorithms affect them, and how al algorithms affect them within a product design space. How many of you can really necessarily opt out of your Facebook timeline or the problems of a Facebook timeline inside of your, uh, inside of your actual Facebook profile? If someone is using timeline and you're not, not that you can opt out of it, it would still affect you. So we aren't giving consumers any way to say yes or no inside of these spaces. And we aren't giving users any way to remove their data from a data model. So, Human rights-centered design is a part of this deeper project I'm starting to work on for the Mozilla Foundation, which is this uh, methodology called Designing for Transparency. So uh, my project outlines three principles for designing with transparency machine learning, which is legibility, the ability to audit, and creating spaces for impact and interaction, and then using design to explain what is happening inside of an algorithm, a data model, or a product. But what does it mean to really call for transparency in machine learning? And more importantly, what does it mean to design for transparency? Transparency can mean many different things, and it can be used or weaponized for marketing campaigns or for this platonic ideal of safety, right? Transparency often gets related to trust. Ideals in this space, then, can exist purely as talking points and are not, necess not necessarily implemented in the product or the service. And trust is tied to transparency, then, in this kind of transaction. 
And I think within product design and software design, there are two different versions of trust. Trust is, is deployed as a modern design trope, as a way to describe relationships between the user and the software. What does it mean to design for trust when trust can exist as implicit trust or explicit trust? It's important to highlight how trust can be gained, but that's, but that's what's key here, is how trust is articulated and shown to users. Explicit trust is seemingly clear and seemingly transparent because an action or policy seems to be clearly stated and seems to be as key. Explicit trust can be gained, as we've seen with GDPR notices. While privacy policies can be confusing and GDP, GDPR websites can force consent by forcing dark patterns that really obscure our choices, the appearance of clearly stating these policies gives the illusion and the feeling of this being explicit trust, because this choice now seems to be out in the open instead of being implied. This clear statement with direct links can create the, this illusion of transparency. And I want to highlight some interesting book or an interesting book about trust and technology. In her book, Calm Technology, Amber Case highlights how privacy policies can be systems that create trust in products. She writes, great privacy user experience means that your users will understand the privacy policy you've created when they start to use your app. A well-built app will let users know what they're opting into when they're using your software. So design can really be the space to show those policies, such as designing in an opt-in UI and user flow. And some GDPR notices do have this. Case continues by describing how privacy policies to users, how to explain privacy policies to users by using something called plain language and offering multiple opt-out points such as explaining what the product or service is collecting and why, how that data will be used, allowing users to download their own data for the service or product, allowing for the option to permanently delete accounts and remove their data from a company's servers. Case argues that design considerations are that these design considerations are actually transparency and that this form of transparency will create trust that companies want with the users um, that they're interacting with. And in fact, we could argue Case isn't just describing well-articulated privacy policies. She's really also advocating for user agency. The opt-in isn't necessarily a form of transparency, but an interaction a user can take to have some control agency and even equity inside of a system. The user gets multiple choices in this case and not one specific flow or interaction that they're forced into. But in some cases, we really need implicit trust. While working as an online harassment researcher for the Wikimedia Foundation, my research had to be open source and shared with the community. But online harassment data are people's personal stories about trauma that an individual has experienced. Sharing specific takeaways or linking to a harassment report um, can actually out an individual, re-traumatize them, or restart a harassment case. So instead, my team and I created this uh, form of semi-public research we called being transparently opaque, which sounds kind of like a misnomer, but bear with me. Instead of showing exact cases of harassment or linking to a specific wiki page, we would generally describe the data we had collected, such as, we ran three surveys over the course of X months that X individuals filled out. We then spoke to 20 users about harassment they experienced from this kind of harassment case to this kind of harassment case, and then we generally read a series of different wiki pages. Then any takeaway we shared would be anonymized if used in a report or, or, or presentation. So, out of this, I'd like to argue that trust isn't transparency, but can be a byproduct of transparency, which leads me back to an original this original question, what does it mean to design for transparency machine learning and how do we do it, especially using sensitive data? Because data in machine learning by all digital products and software is important, data comes from people. So I covered this earlier, but to reiterate, I'm, I'm defining transparency as these three things. Transparency is a mixture of legibility, which is the ability to understand auditability or the ability to audit a process, data point, or intention, so building upon legibility, and then understand it enough to request changes or give feedback. And then interaction or agency, the ability to affect change or decision making from auditability. Legibility really means that something has to be stated and revealed to us, but the process has to be understandable. 
Let's examine bureaucratic procedures as a metaphor for AI for a second. In this example, the processes are revealed almost explicitly shared, but that doesn't mean we understand it. That doesn't mean that common users understand why a bureaucratic procedure happens or what it actually means. And this key takeaway is important. One could share or say what a policy process is, but for it to be understandable, it has to, it has to have legibility to be really transparent in this case. So what does legibility look like in action? Well, this is when it's important to think of design not just as UX, UI, or graphic. It's content strategy and it's communication design. It's distilling or rather translating complexities into an artifact. An artifact can be an app or it can be clear and concise documentation. ATNF, a design and technology firm centered in the arm of the US federal government, designed a content guide and curriculum on how to use plain language in governmental and federal services. When they created, what they created was an asset that was flexible and that it could scale from a local level all the way up to a national level. And it was flexible in the sense that it was guidelines and principles. This is what they thought about scalability across a federal system. Legibility is important when it manifests, though, as designed user experience in a system. When it fails, it can have incredibly dire consequences because legibility requires analyzing distilling these systems. And when those systems fail and we rely solely on documentation, problems happen. So in January 13th, 2018, a federal employee in Hawaii accidentally sent out the f this message. And this is what everyone within the state of Hawaii saw on their phones. And this was up for 30 minutes. And this was a false alarm. There were no missiles en route. But people believed this for 30 minutes as this is the notification that they had received. But what had actually happened to sort of cause this trigger was a f an internal group was testing and updating crisis software that looked like this. So it's important to note here that this is actual software and actual interface. And this is a what a lot of software looks like for civil servants. Sid Harrell, a civic designer and former head of code of head of product at Code for America retweeted this in response. The greatest trick the devil ever pulled was convincing the world that enterprise software complexity is properly addressed via training. And that kind of explains how the previous slide came to be designed, doesn't it? The legibility here was that training could solve and overcome any kind of complexity. But we know that this isn't true because of what happened. It's important to look at this that nothing in the UI is really legible or understandable. Where is the logic, the hierarchy, the selection? Was there a confirmation UI that popped up prompting the user to really reaffirm the choice they were making? In an interview with me, Harold said, I think it's true in the commercial world that interfaces for employees are rarely as good as interfaces for customers or users. And in particular, when departments are strapped by resources and constrained, if you read any of the sources about Hawaii, the government there had only three vendors you, uh, you could choose to work with, and those requirements don't include things like usability. Usability and legibility are what help make products and processes transparent and not adversarial. And while these examples are not explicitly about machine learning, it works really well as a descriptor specifically on legibility throughout the entire product and design cycle. But seeing something and understanding something are not quite transparency, it's really just the first step. Which brings us to auditability. Mal Sauter, a researcher and author, explained auditability in an interview. They say, what we've lost in this rush towards transparency is we now have this ability to just see things. But seeing something isn't really having an impact on something. But we still need to see something to understand it, right? So auditability builds upon legibility to offer a space to audit. For machine learning, this is really important. Removing bias and discussing data steps are often the suggestions for transparency, but being able to audit and provide feedback that will be taken into consideration or actually having the ability to change the product is necessary. We see auditability in open source. That can be filing a bug report or forking code. It can be volunteering to create a process or product. And then having that thing you've suggested accepted and acknowledged in the ecosystem or service. Auditability can also be public forums where users or volunteers can voice concerns and see a response and impact from that. 
But couldn't that also just be a better description of interaction or impact? Well, we need to go a step further, which is you need to design the space for interaction and agency. And again, Sauter reinforces this as impact. A firm can announce we're doing X at this location, and that is a form of transparency, because they're revealing the location and announcing what they're doing. But can people meaningfully interact or change that situation? You have to have the ability to impact it and for that impact to be meaningful, meaning the system needs to be designed to take what was audited and respond to that and and then there have an emphasis, emphasis that some kind of impl implementation will happen or could happen at some point. So what does this mean in practice to design transparency for machine learning? It's applying those standards um, to looking at how data is used, how an algorithm is trained, what the data models uh, training the algorithms are doing, and that how the product itself is using an algorithm. The above um, is what I'm sort of calling data ingredients, calls out of this methodology for designing for transparency. Should data sets have ratings, explanations, or readable labels? Drugs in the United States have many approval processes. They're tested, um, they're looked at the different kinds of ingredients, they're looked at how they would be able to solve or impact different kinds of um, injuries or illnesses, et cetera. Food, for example, also has ingredients and caloric information listed. While this isn't perfect, we should be thinking about ratings and accountability for data. What if algorithms came with this kind of labeling? If you think this is a good idea, you're maybe not the only one. A similar methodology has also been proposed by Kate Crawford, the head of AI Now, and a group of collaborators in a paper called Data Sheets, or Better Ways to Label Data Sets. Is this our data future? It, it could be. And this is where I think design is really, really useful in, in this conversation. Design is what can distill policy and code into a, a digestible and interactable interface for users. Design is really that thing that can explain what code and policy are doing. Especially when it comes to machine learning, design is important, and it's really integral to this bigger idea of human rights-centered design. So let's imagine these frameworks I've sort of outlined uh, more in action. Let me tell you this weird, adjacent, but funny side story. Um, I dated someone four years ago who had really beautiful, like Disney Prince style hair, and he broke my heart. And I'm sure some of you have done here. You probably, I don't know if you listened to a lot of music during a breakup, but I definitely did. And my Spotify drug of choice was this embarrassing band called Mumford and Sons. And I listened to that band every single day for about like two months on repeat. And do you have an idea of like what that did? It like fucked up my Discover Weekly and it's still fucked up. And that was four years ago. <laughs> and the worst part about this is like I fucked it up. Like I, I don't know if I can really blame anybody else. Like I'm completely culpable in this. Um, and to this day, I still get recommendations that are like, I call them like light, poppy versions of Mumford & Sons, if you can imagine such bands existing. And this maybe seems like a really innocuous and silly example, but I think it's important to highlight because I actually can't really intervene in my Discover Weekly to change it. There's not really anything I can do in the algorithm of that product to retrain it. And I use Spotify every single day because I spend a lot of time working, listening to music. So why can't I make my Discover Weekly forget? Why can't I, as a user, suggest what I'm actually interested in right now? Can I just please fucking block like Mumford & Sons from my Discover Weekly? And I highlight this because if an algorithm is looking for user flags and cues, some of those cues may not be good, e.g. Mumford & Sons. Some of those flags may also be an accident. So what you see here is a suggestion I made for Harvard Shorenstein Center's publication called Privacy by Design. And it pulls from my designing for transparency methodology, kind of imagines, well, what if, what if this kind of label really did exist in my Discover Weekly? What if I could just click on an I for ingredients and have some kind of breakdown as to maybe how their Discover Weekly was made and some kind of way for me to forget things or suggest things or like design what could be a, a better version of my Discover Weekly. I think this is important because it's really just trying to explain what it's doing and allowing space for user agency in a way that could also like fit inside of the product. And I think this really embodies this human rights centered design mindset. Which sort of brings us to what is human rights centered design? 
Well, it puts user agency first by always focusing on consent. Everything should have a way for a user to say yes or no. Human rights center design is data protection first, We're recognizing that data is human inherently always. This methodology doesn't design only with opt-out in mind. Human rights center design is participatory by nature. It designs for the global south first, centering on a diversity of experiences and understands that localization is different than translation, that language and access is key and design is integral in that. It actively asks what could possibly go wrong in this product, it designs for all shades of the problem from the benign to the extreme and then plans for those use cases because it views use cases not as edge cases. Human rights center design knows that a bug is a feature until you fix it. And it's also important to ask then or look at our society and think of well, what are design-based human rights violations? And two come to mind, one is a bit more extreme and the other is a bit more benign, but nonetheless, we should view both of them as human rights center design violations. We should also just view them perhaps as human rights violations. The first one is this one, the systems and protocols for content moderators. The tools, the policies, and time limits, in addition to the content, the content moderators are, for are forced to look at on social networks, and the systems they are forced to work within are human rights violations. Most content moderators have to under, um, have under a handful of seconds to make a decision while looking at some of the most grotesque, violent, traumatic, and upsetting content posts and images, all while having to memorize specific policy and trainings from platforms. And it's important that we see this entirety, the tools that they use as well as the content that they're looking at, the policies that they're engaging with, and the lack of support that they face from Facebook and Twitter as a human rights violation. This is a pretty serious one. So what is a more benign one? I think we could argue location services automatically turned on. So does location services automatically turn on on platform and images violate human rights? Well, let's start to look at it and ask, does it endanger sovereignty? When you're designing, it's always important to ask, who does it serve and who does it harm? Does this deploy dignity? We can have opt-in for location services in the design, and users should be able to choose location individually, not automatically on images and posts. And that choosing of location can be something really silly, and that can be enjoyable. Maybe I want to say that I was hanging out in the woods yesterday in Moose Jaw, Canada, which is a very real place in Canada that I really want to visit. What does it harm when my location services are revealed, though? Or like my actual real location? We'll ask any victim of domestic violence, ask any victim of online harassment, maybe ask any marginalized person who's faced death threats. Does Instagram really, really need my real locations to make a better product? Does Apple? I think we can make better things if we think about human rights-centered design as this kind of methodology inside of large systems, but especially with machine learning, because it's looking at policy, design, and code as ways to express user sovereignty. So TLDR, or spoiler alert rather, this wasn't necessarily a talk just about AI. It was really a design talk about ethics. Um, thank you for your time. If you have any questions, uh, I'd love to chat and feel free to drop me a note at my Mozilla email. Thank you. I think we have time for questions, and there's someone with a mic. Yes, we have time for questions. And there's a microphone in the middle, so queue up for questions if questions arise. We have plenty of time for upcoming questions. So feel free to ask your questions, and um, we will have time for them. Yep. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for this really interesting talk. Um, could you talk a bit more about the uptick of the feminist data set? Is this used somewhere and um, how? So it's not used yet. Um, it's like a multi-year long process. So right now I'm still in the process of, of collecting the data. Um, but the next step is sort of looking at, well, what, what would be the system for training that data? How would you make a data model? Right now, a very popular way to sort of train uh, any kind of data model for machine learning would be using Amazon's Mechanical Turk. But because the project is sort of guided by an intersectional feminist framework, you know, one has to ask, is Mechanical Turk um, ethical? 
does the existence of Mechanical Turk or the way that, that, that workers are treated on that platform a manifestation of, of like feminist ideology, and, and it's not. So the next step is trying to think about, well, what, what would be an ethical way to train data with people? Um, is it inherently like the system that Mechanical Turk has designed, or is it that Amazon has optimized it towards payment towards Amazon, not payment towards the employee? So the next step of this project is thinking about, is that something that I have to redesign or partner with um, like a group on? Like, should there be an open source like small-scale version of Mechanical Turk. We have another question from there. Yes, thank you very for your insightful talk. I got another question from all the things and projects you work on. You talked about design ethics, essentially, as you mentioned. Where you think how these are features where I expect that a law body or a counting body should, re should enforce them or did something you would like to see? Oh, are, um, are you asking about like regulation maybe? Okay. Um, I am always hesitant, and this is probably because I am an American, to sort of say where regulations should exist. Um, and I feel like when, when we start to look at the ways in which a lot of representatives of different countries or different states understand AI, there seems to be very much like a big knowledge gap from like the way in which perhaps a lawmaker understands or can, can conceptualize of AI from like a technologist. Um, I think that there are small steps that can happen. Um, I like the idea of GDPR is a good one. In practice, maybe it needs to be refined because a lot of companies are figuring out ways around um, like having people actually opt out of tracking, right? So I think that there is a space for regulation. I really would hesitate to say that that's one we should take right now. But I do think that there needs to be um, like a moratorium, for example, on facial recognition software. Like that's one thing where um, a lot of different researchers and experts who look specifically at facial recognition have called for this moratorium, even on like the deployment or creation of algorithms. Like let's not even try to make them more accurate. This is not necessarily something that needs to exist. So I think that there's a space between um, like regulation and also experts coming together and saying like this is actually something we won't work on. I'm not sure quite what that sweet spot is though. Hello. I also really appreciate your work um, and research. I'm sh pretty sure it's, it can be very frustrating and complex, but I, I'm into ethics and I wanted to ask about the specific feminist data design, would you then more opt for like splitting platforms to create specific designs for them? Because we know like, you know, Facebook and Twitter and whatever, they include everybody, you know, everybody's ethics. And of course, then it's quite difficult to take a, co to get a common ground, you know, on a global scale, even like ethics depend on countries, cultures and all those things. So do you opt more in a, pra I'm looking at the practical, you know, implementation. Are you then more like splitting communities, splitting platforms and stuff? Or you really think it's realistic to implement that on a global platform? Are you talking about some of the different frameworks I've suggested or like feminist data set? Yeah, I, I would just take feminist data set as a template or example. Like, do you think it, it would work for all social media platforms? Or no, I'm, do you, what is your, your end product or your end vision? So Feminist Dataset is an art project that's pulling a lot of like English-centered data and language. Mm, um, yeah. I mean, there are so many different kinds of data sets that aren't like not every algorithm or machine learning system is using every data set in existence, right? Yeah, of course not, yeah. Right? Or like they'll use a part of a data set that can train or inform something and then they're pulling from different kinds of data sets. The creation of feminist data set is not to say like everyone should use one data set. That also I think would be like very irresponsible and not a solution. But the idea behind it is more how can we think about community created data sets and then how can we look at like 
the ideology of intersectional feminism as a framework, because it is a framework. It defines um, what is, like, what are politics we can focus on, or the idea of sovereignty amongst, like, fem, fem people, non gender binary, and trans people, right? Yeah, it's yeah. sort of, it's, it's about that kind of emphasis. But so, you understand my point of questioning? It's a very right. specific... Right, but I'm responding to you and saying that, like, I don't think any data set, one data set, should be used globally inside of one large system. Mm, okay. And that's my counterpoint yeah, to Yeah, I, I get it. Yeah, okay. Thanks. So, we have time for more questions. Do we have another question? Okay, though, I think we wrap this up here. Thanks for the great speech, Caroline Sinders. Yeah, thank you.